brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Thursday night uh, talks that we've been having now during Lent. Obviously, with uh, great joy, we welcome this evening, uh, and we feel very privileged and very blessed to have uh, Yolanda Yolanda with us this evening. Uh, we understand how valuable his time is and how he has so many commitments, uh, being, uh, especially with the monastery, and we thank him from the bottom of our hearts for accepting our invitation and for gracing us and blessing us with his presence this evening. Uh, I will invite you to start with the prayer uh, and then obviously he can uh, continue with his talk. So Yolanda, thank you very much. It is um, always a great joy to be able to be amongst um, all of you, the blessed people of the blessed parish of St. Catherine's. Thank you, Father Stavro, for your kind words and for your kind invitation to share with everyone a few thoughts based on the life of St. Mary of Egypt and sharing also a few thoughts um, regarding repentance. We are already approaching the end of the Great Lent and our Church has arranged to celebrate the memory of a great saint of our church, St. Mary of Egypt, on the fifth Sunday of the Great Lent, which is also the last Sunday, because as we all know, then we have the weekend of the Saturday of Lazarus, the Palm Sunday, and then we are entering the Holy Week. It seems, I don't know about you, but it seems that this great Lent was very quick. Even right from the beginning, you, you had the impression that it would pass very quickly, and I think this is what happened. St. Mary of Egypt is a great saint of our church, and her life is an amazing example of repentance, an amazing example for all of us not to give up, but uh, to continue in order to find um, our path towards salvation. We know from the Synaxarion, from the life of the of Saint Mary that when she was she was only 12 years old when she decided to leave her parents go to Alexandria and then she spent 18 years if I remember correctly living a life full of sin and um, we would say being dragged by the flames of passions. 
And then, one day, she saw she, at the port of Alexandria a few people embarking on a boat to go to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage in order to venerate the Holy Cross as the feast of the elevation of the Holy Cross was approaching. And obviously the reason why St. Mary decided to embark on this boat was not the same reason as the rest of the people that they were on the boat, but it was because she wanted uh, to continue uh, this life that she was um, living. And there is one small detail that St. Mary shares from this journey, which is for someone, someone would say that it's embarrassing to mention. But many a times we say that the saints, they were never embarrassed to mention in their writings the truth. And this is what St. Mary of Egypt did when she shared to, with Abba Josimas all her previous life. And she says, what happened during this journey And the things that happened there were despicable and you cannot even um, describe them. And she said, I wonder how God showed mercy on us and the boat did not sink. But obviously God had his own reasons and God always sees the bigger picture, which is something that most of us, we fail to do during our lifetime. So St. Mary reached her destination, and she didn't realize what was going on, but she finds herself outside of the church, of the great church of the Holy Resurrection at Jerusalem, where people were going to venerate the precious cross. And this is when something amazing happened. God, who did not want to allow St. Mary to fall into perdition and for her soul to be destroyed and to be lost, devises a plan. And every time St. Mary was trying to go into the church to venerate, there was an unseen force keeping her away. It happened, this happened a few times, and then all of a sudden, St. Mary realized that there was a reason why she was not allowed to enter the Church of the Resurrection. And she realized that the reason was because of her sins, because she was full of sin. And then immediately, opposite the entrance, there was an icon of the Virgin Mary, Saint Mary felt remorse inside her and she goes to the icon of Panagia and she prayed 
and she asked Panagia to help her in order to be able to venerate the Holy Cross, but also to be able to leave her past life behind in order to make a new start. And the tradition says that this icon of Panagia, which was the icon that St. Mary of Egypt prayed, is located inside the cave on Mount Athos of St. Athanasius, the Athonite. And this is when, uh, where uh, the fathers, uh, the, the monks, they also, uh, on the day of the Akathist, like tomorrow, they, they keep a, an all-night vigil in front of this icon. Panagia held her, St. Mary was able to venerate the Holy Cross, and she listens to the voice of Panagia, which said to her, go through the Jordan River to the desert in order for you to struggle and cry for your sins. And St. Mary of Egypt, the tradition says that she only received three loaves of bread with her. She then continued, she had called a Holy Communion before entering the desert that Sunday. She enters into the arena of her struggles and she remains in the desert for 48 years battling with her past memories, her passions, up until the time came that God provided for her to be able to receive Holy Communion by Abbas Josimas, as we all know, whom he happened to be in the desert because back then the desert fathers were following this beautiful ascetical tradition of leaving their monastic dwellings, their monasteries, or their parishes, sometimes if they were priest monks, and they would go and retreat into the desert immediately. I think after, before the beginning of the Great Lent, and they would all come back. Do you remember which day? For all of you that you have, you know this tradition, the hymns of the church of this day, they talk about this. It's a Palm Sunday. That's why I think it's during Vespers of Palm Sunday, there is a specific tropario that we chant a lot of times. And this tropario says that today the grace of God has gathered us together. And this tropario was reflecting of this tradition that all the fathers, all the monastics, having stayed in the desert for all these 40 days, they would come together in order to celebrate Holy Week and Pascha and Easter. Which is amazing if you think about it actually on Palm Sunday, everyone coming together and sharing their experiences and their struggles and what they've gained through these ascetical struggles during the 40 days. So, Avasu Simas, while he entered into the desert to follow this tradition, he saw St. Mary of Egypt. At the beginning, he was scared, he was afraid because he was not able to understand who was this in front of him because, because of all the tribulations she had gone through. You couldn't even tell if she was a human being, as the life uh, says. St. Mary then confessed to him and shared with him her story. Avazo Simas, the next year, 
He visited her, she gave her, he gave her Holy Communion. And the year after that they had sort of like an appointment to meet again, he went and he found St. Mary of Egypt having passed away when the day that he, she received Holy Communion. And how did he find out about this? Because St. Mary, she had engraved on the soil the date and also she explained to him what had happened and she also, I think, wrote down her name because I think also she must have forgotten to ask for her name. If we go and we read her life, especially at the great Synaxaristis, which is one of the books of the church that we would, would always recommend you to have at home, I'm sure that you will be able to immerse in this beautiful life. And there are many, many other details that we'll have to talk, I think, for hours to share with everyone. But St. Mary of Egypt is an example in many different ways. First of all, from her life, we realize up to which point someone can fall. And this is something that it makes you think when you go through her life of all the things that she was going through even before she repented. Because even if we have the freedom, which we do have the freedom, to do whatever we feel like doing, this doesn't mean that we are happy. So St. Mary was influenced by passions that they were not letting her make a new start for years. But it is obvious that she was suffering from these passions. At the same time, but in her life, we can understand that there is always repentance. And through repentance, someone may become again a precious vessel of the Holy Spirit. In our lifetime, we realize that we are all struggling in many different ways. And sometimes, if you think about it, this struggle might seem tragic. Sometimes this struggle for repentance might seem too intense. It does become intense sometimes. But at the same time, this struggle for repentance and salvation may also become something which is the most amazing and beautiful thing in our life. Everyone around us is like one of us, meaning if we fall into the mindset of looking around us and trying to understand or explain why everyone around us is doing something specific or is going through something which is either good or bad, we always have the danger, there's always the danger of us falling into judgment. So one thing that we have to accept is that everyone is going through their own struggles. More or less, we all fall into sin. But the church is a hospital. 
And we always accept people in the church that sometimes they might be sinking in the sea of sin. And sometimes this is sinking into sin, as we mentioned before, is to such a degree that you are wondering, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think we are all, all wondering about this. How is it that someone can recover from such a struggle? And how is it that someone can make a new start? Although in the church, listening to the hymns, to the prayers that we read, the idea of repentance is prominent. We always listen to the word of repentance, that we should never despair. As many times as we fall, we are going to read, I think, in the prayers of the Holy Anxion, in the Holy Week, we have to rise up again and make a new start. And we can say that we find ourselves suffering. Sometimes we also find ourselves being ridiculed by our passions. It happens, especially when we realize that at certain moments we do not have control on us and our passions take on this control. Sometimes we feel that we are chain bound by our passions and by our desires. And then you are wondering, so what is this that we can do if everyone is going through struggles, if everyone is battling with their passions, what is this that we can do so that we can follow the example of St. Mary of Egypt? There is one thing that we can do And this is something that God saw when he decided to intervene and help St. Mary of Egypt. God saw inside her heart that there was crack, like when you have a wall in front of you, if the wall is perfectly made, you cannot see light or you cannot see through this wall. It's the same with a wooden door or anything man-made anyway. But if because of the weather or the old, if it is old, this structure, there are cracks starting, then you can see through. This is what happened with St. Mary of Egypt. Although it seemed that there was no chance for her to repent, she was immersed, as we said. Actually, the, her life says that she was so immersed into this life that this life had become for her an addiction. So she had ended up not even asking for money for what she was doing because she was driven by her addictions. Having said that, God who is always able to see through, saw that there was a crack inside her heart and he used this crack so that, she, so that he is able to penetrate 
and make her understand a few things. So although sometimes we find ourselves falling, and this happens a lot of times, there is one thing that can save us, and this is if we haven't allowed our heart to be completely immersed into the sin. It depends how much we love God, even if we find ourselves falling all the time. So going back now to her life, I will just mention two or three things and then we can have a discussion or you can ask questions if, also, if you have any questions to ask. There is a pivotal moment in her life which was very important for the start of her repentance. Would anyone know what was this moment? Or would anyone would like to share with us what you think that this moment was in her life? Any ideas? I'm sorry we have all heard of her life, <clears throat> and even from this few things that I've mentioned just before. Anyone? What is this that changed? Obviously God's intervention, but then she came to the realization that she was not able to venerate the Holy Cross because of her sins. Up until that moment, she was just continuing with what she was doing without even realizing it, probably, that at some moment she had to stop because her path was not a desirable one for her salvation. So, she came to the realization that she had to do something about it. She had to do something about her life because she could not continue like this. This is a very important moment. And I'm telling you that unless we come to the realization that we are doing something wrong, we just keep going. And then you have people around you trying to tell you something, but it is as if you want to continue hitting your head on a wall. And although you know that you are not able to go through this wall, you just keep repeating the same actions again and again and again, because you, you do not realize that this is happening. Now another question. Hopefully I will get an answer. <laughs> Why do you think some people, they come to the realization, and other people don't. What does this mean, that God discriminates, that God enlightens some people to do the right thing, and He allows other people to continue doing their own things? Yes? It's ourselves. Yes? 
It's ourselves that sometimes we do not want to realize a few things. Modern world, modern society is very appealing. Sometimes you feel like you are drawn to do things. Although you know that they are not the right things, you still you feel like you are drawn. You feel like, it's what St. Apostle Paul, I think, says. You feel like there is something else inside you, drawing you to do things that you do not want to, and yet, he cannot resist. Anyone else? Uh, ego. ego. And when and when we are full of ego, when we are full of ourselves inside us, what does this mean? Yes? We become ignorant. Yes, we become ignorant, of course. I've heard of this, but I didn't want to mention it because I think more or less everyone knows about this, yes. But yes, obviously, we keep repeating the same things all over again, and we do not realize that these things are catastrophic, destructive for us sometimes, yes. But when we are full of ourselves, when we are full of our ego, when we become ignorant, as it was mentioned, when we find ourselves not willing to change because we are okay how we are, then, as we can understand inside us, we cannot make space for God. And believe me, if God is able to find just a little bit of space, inside us, just a bit of this crack broke me, as we say in Greek, then he is able to penetrate. If you think about it, this is very sad. And I will explain to you why. Because you are able to understand how much God tries to help us, and then, when you see people not willing to change, to be honest, including ourselves, then you become sad because it is as if you are stopping God. It's as if you are saying to God, okay, I want to be close to you, but up to this point. Once you, you pass the, this point, I don't want you to be involved in my life because I have my own ways and because my ego, we are not able to understand this, my opinion, my ideas, my past life, my current habits, I like them, I love them. They give to me pleasure, happiness, joy, freedom. It is not freedom, but it, it, it feels like freedom. And I want you to be away from me, or up to the extent that I can handle you. But if we do not have space inside us, then how is God going to intervene? And then what is this that's happening? We find ourselves going up and down, up and down. One day we are good, another day we are bad. The great land starts and we say, I'm going to pray, I'm going to make frustrations, I'm going to continue with my fasting that I, I didn't end up doing last great land a year ago. And we start strong 
and we become inspired and we get excited and then we find ourselves awake or to awake down the track in the great length that we start going backwards. But is this a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? when we find ourselves going up and down, and when we find ourselves falling and rising up again. What do you think? Is this good or bad? Good. Good. Why? Because it's realization in God is giving that realization that you know Yes, it's the realization, as we said, yes. It is always, it's always good to understand that we are up and down, as simple as that. Yes, yes, of course, of course. This is good, this, all, all, all these are very good points, yes. But there is something else that I'm missing. <laughs> Can you think? We realize that we are not going to be here forever. As we always say, and I always keep reminding this to my, myself and also other people. I always say to the people, life is too short. Whether we live for 50 years or for 120 years, it's still very short compared to eternity. Yes, but it is good to come to the realization that we are not going to be here forever because if we understand this, I'm telling you, we are able to see things in a different way. Yes? We become humble. This is the truth. Yes, yes. And sometimes when we fall in a certain way, we might become even more humble. Because failings from failings, they're different. So there are some failings that we find ourselves 
hitting rock bottom, how we say. But when we realize that sometimes we cannot do much, and it seems that it is not under our control, although it is, but in different ways, then we come to the realization of something else, which is that there are things that we can't do anything about them, and God has to intervene. And this realization is also something which is very important. We realize that we need God. It's not that God needs us. We need God. We need His intervention. We have to allow Him to penetrate through us. We have to make some space inside us for Him. And we have to start demolishing this wall so that He can start cracking. And because He is so kind, He doesn't mind, even if He is able to go through this cracking. He can even make wonders but just a small crack inside our soul and inside our heart. Why is this? Because he's a very good doctor. He knows how to treat every ailment and disease that we have inside us. But as we all know, and I'm sure that Dr. Nick can also attest to this, is that there are many good doctors, but they can't do anything about your sickness or your diseases unless you decide to come visit them and ask for their help. So God is a very good doctor, but if you do not allow him to work with you, through you, for you, sometimes he is there waiting for us, then we just remain stagnant. Okay, so the first important pivotal moment in Saint Mary of Egypt life was the realization that she had to do something about it because God was so kind to show to her that she couldn't continue like this. Which is also the case sometimes with us. There is a moment that we realize that we cannot continue like this. Not because of any other reason, but we understand that we start going downwards, and the more you go downwards, then you are speeding, and you cannot control this falling downwards. There is another moment, but any idea? Think about what happened next. Pardon? The moment she realized that she had to do something about it, she couldn't live anymore like this. This is a very good point. It's a very good point. Something else? She to help her, yes. She accepted Panagia's help. She realized inside her that Panagia was her mother, that Panagia was not to judge her, but Panagia would always be next to her for the rest of her life. So Panagia basically felt sorry for St. Mary and she decided to intervene. Yes. Anyone else? She realized what was going on. She had Panagia as her protectress. She couldn't continue living like this. So what's the next step? What is this that she did? Pardon? She asked for help, yes. And then she went to the desert. Yes. 
she went to the desert. Now, why do I emphasize this? Because sometimes we might come to the realization that there is something wrong. But we might do nothing about it. And we just continue. And why is this? Maybe because it is not the right moment for us to act upon this realization. There is always the, the appropriate time for everything. That's why sometimes when we have people coming for confession, we understand that they might not be able to confess everything. And this is because they are embarrassed, they are afraid, or they can't even remember what is this that they have done in the past, or because they are not there yet to understand that what they did was something wrong. And sometimes it might take two or three or four or five or six confessions or a lifetime to understand a few things that they are going on inside us and yet we do not realize them. That's why I personally believe and also Father Stavros can also comment on this and Father Irineus and Father Paisius. Um, I personally believe that We have to respect this. We have to respect the freedom of the other person. Even if we know that this person has no things to say, no things to confess. We can never just go and push things. That's why personally, I don't know if this is good or bad, Sometimes people ask me and they say, oh, ask me questions if you want, if you're in confession. I say to them, I'm sorry, but I'm not asking any questions. Because I know that some people might be able to find out about things that they had inside them lurking for years, through a simple question that the Father Confessor might ask, not for any other, other reason, but just to help the person who is confessing. But I'm telling you, if this, whatever you're going to confess, comes out untimely, can create so many issues inside you, that sometimes not even the Father Confessor can deal with. And definitely not the person that he or she or he will confess. So, I thought this lady, I'm not saying that whenever the people come for confession, we tell them, no, no, that's okay, everything's okay. <laughs> we have the responsibility to point out to the people what is right and what is wrong. But we have to do this in such a kind and gentle way so that the people confess what they have to confess when it's the right time. Because have you noticed that God respects this? Have you ever seen any person, you know, like, oh, God grabbing any other person from this and telling him you have to go to confession? That is why there might be people that they might be 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years old and they haven't confessed yet. Why is this? Because it is not important for them. It is important. We can't stress enough how important confession is in our spiritual life. And yet, God allows this to happen. For a reason. He only knows the reason. So, St. Mary of Egypt decided that she had to go to the desert.
because she had the will inside her. She did this will. She was ready. She was determined. In order for us to repent, we have to be determined. We have to make the decision. Just the decision. Regardless of, of, of how we are going to make it afterwards in the journey. Just make the decision. <laughs> Say to yourself, it's time for me to change. I have to. I can't just continue like this. There is a saying, I think. I don't know if it is an Australian saying or Italian or European. They say that you can get the horse to drink water. You can drive the horse to drink water. But if the horse do, do not, doesn't want to, you cannot make it drink water, even if you just force it. So that's why it has to be the right time. And I find myself wanting to get out of this labyrinth that I'm in. I might not be able yet to get myself out of this, but inside me, I look inside me, and what is this that I find? Volusy, will. I say to myself, it is time. I cannot wait any, wait any longer. I have to do it. This is the will that we have to have, and this is the will that drove St. Mary of Egypt to leave everything behind and enter the desert with three loaves of bread that she knew that was not going to be enough anyway, just for how many days? Okay. She did not take anything with her, and she knew that in a few weeks or months or years, she wouldn't have anything to wear. She didn't even take with her a vessel to draw a bit of water. Why was this? Because she was ready for battle. Inside her, she knew that there was no return. She had to do this. And she put her trust into God. And sometimes we are wondering, yes, but the saints, they were strong and they had determination. Do we have the same determination? Do we have the same strength? Comparing to the saints or comparing our life with their lives? Obviously not. We are not as strong as the older generations. What is this that we can do? We can do many things. We can do many things. And why is this? Because the road to salvation and the path of repentance for everyone of us is very individual. It is. You can see this in the lives of the saints. For example, you see one saint, all of a sudden, willing to go up to a column. The, how we used to call them? Saint, the Starlights, yes. Or the Keonites, Keonites. And the first time, I don't know if you know about this story, the first time that uh, a saint decided to follow this practice of asceticism, everyone thought around him that he was not well in his mind. That he, was either, he had either uh, um, uh, fallen into delusion, or he thought that he, uh, that he was somebody as an example for the rest of the people. I think it was St. Simeon, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong. And he goes up to this column. He was the first starlight. And all of the fathers around him, they say to him, hey, what are you doing there? Come down. Who do you think you are? We haven't seen this ascetical practice uh, yet. What you are doing is delusion. They couldn't comprehend. If we were in their shoes, we would have said many other things to this saint. What is this that Saint Simeon does? Do you remember? It's 
It's very interesting, actually. Sometimes from the lives of the saints we can learn a lot of things from these small details. Anyone? came down. He didn't say, you can't understand me, which is something that would have said. <laughs> Who do you think you are? That you're going to stop me from doing what I want to do? How is it that you don't allow a spiritual person to continue with their spiritual struggles? He didn't say anything. Why? Because he was driven by humility. Not obedience, not pride. He comes down and he says to them, Fathers, if you think that I'm wrong, forgive. And teach me and tell me what is this that I should do. And the Synaxario says that the fathers, because of his, this reply, they realized that he was genuine. And they allowed him to go back and pray for them, and he was the one to start this tradition of the stylites. So, there are different types of ascetical struggles, there are different paths to salvation. You see other saints, or spiritual people, or simple monks, sitting on a pezzuli, how we say it in Greek, like a, like a bricked up wall, and moving their legs. The tradition, it's, it's in the tradition of Mount Athos, I think. And someone goes to this father and says to him, Father, what are you doing there? You're just sitting there, you're just moving your legs. <laughs> and he says to them, Kunotus podas, yet in Arapto Christo. I'm moving my legs for the love of Christ. This is what he could do. And God accepted this. And you find other people fasting for many days. But you also have other people, like for example, Saint Eusebius, that we are going to talk about him at the talk that we have at All Saints on Monday. And that he could not do that much of asceticism. He was already always not that well. He was suffering from low grade fever. He had to eat a bit more substantial food, and his Yeroda Badorotheos was allowed him because he had discernment. He could not go to the service very early on. He got tuberculosis after a few years, he was very young. After some time, he passes away. And then it happened that one of the fathers had his in a vision, saw him amongst the rest of the fathers that they were sanctified in this monastery. And the fathers, they started saying between themselves, what is this that this monk did to become a saint? But this was his individual path of repentance and of salvation, which is totally opposite and different from your path and your path and my path. It's just that we have to embrace our path to salvation. With whatever strength we have, and things might be difficult, because when we start this path, of the realization, and when we have the volition, as St. Mary of Egypt had, as we said, to enter into our own desert, to struggle, there are certain moments that you feel you're not winning. 
I'm sure we have all gone through this. And someone might ask, where is Christ at this moment? St. Mary of Egypt spent 48 years in the desert. And I think if I remember correctly, from these 48 years, it was only after 30 something one years that she found a bit of relief inside her, that God had forgiven her. So she battled out of these 48 years for some 31 years with God being absent in the desert. So where is Christ? Then? Isn't he the one who wants his people to follow the path to salvation? Isn't he the one who goes to find the lost sheep and leaves behind the 99 ones? Where is he? When we are experiencing moments that we think that we are just about to, like, to die out of distraction and out of sadness and out of depression and because we think we can't do anything else. Where is he at this moment? Inside us. I think he's there and he's giving us the chance to, um, I guess, find him, see him, accept him, invite him. You know, even in the darkest moments, I think he's there. He's always there, yes. He's inside us, as we said. But why is it then that we do not experience his presence? He is there. But if you are to go and ask someone who is going through literally like hell, hmm, they won't tell you this. Most of the times they might also start saying, God has a part. Oh, there is a, a famous book which is called Arga Vadizio Christos. I don't know if you have heard of this book. The author is, I think, Saint Nikolai Vladimirovich, a contemporary saint um, of our church. Arga Vadizio Christos, which means Christ appears as if he is approaching us in a slow pace. But why is it then that we experience him like this? Unfortunately, you're right. Most of the times, we are not able to realize a few things unless God presents himself as absent. It, this is another thing that makes you sad. Not because of how God appears, but it is how our human nature is, just allowing ourselves to sometimes to reach rock bottom, when we think that we cannot go any lower, 
when we are able to see everything around us like dark, like darkness, when we think that there is no light there, and then we have to do something. When someone wants to build a house, I think I'm not an engineer, but I think um, the engineers, they have to work in such a way and arrange things in such a way that they go and they dig and dig and dig up until they find the original soil. Otherwise, if they go and they build upon a soil which is not steady, the building is not going to be there forever. So sometimes we have to reach this rock bottom because God is trying through these struggles to find your original self. What is this that is lying inside you? And you have to remove so many layers sometimes in order to find who you are and what is this that you want in your life. But we should never fall into despair. We should always try and continue with our path. And that is why we have to have a spiritual guide who has to guide us in the right way when we find ourselves going through these things. But there is also another pivotal moment. And it seems that at this moment, we are like as if we are just, we are between the good and the bad again, although we have realized what is going on. And I will explain to you how it is, or I will ask you about it. So you think that you are just treading on just thin line, and you don't know if you will either continue going towards the right direction or you will go to the wrong direction. Can anyone guess what is this point? Your conscience. Yes. Close. We have talked about the realization of uh, that we need help and we have to change. Afterwards, we have to have this will to go and do it. Um, pardon? Yes. Yes. Just continue. <clears throat> But there is, but there is this moment that although you continue and although you come to this realization, you are still in danger of falling backwards. Now, this moment is when we realize whom we truly are. And I'm telling you, but sometimes this takes years. So you go for confession, you go for Holy Communion, you are studying, you are praying, you are thinking that you are doing the right thing and I'm not saying that you are not. You are on the right path, as I always say to encourage you. But then, this moment comes that you realize that you have a long way to go. And that although you thought that you were okay and that you are progressing, the deeper you go into the faith, the more things come up and you realize that you're not winning again. When before you thought that you were winning, 
then you reach a point that again you are not winning. And then what is this common mistake that we make at this point? We give up. We give up. We either give up or we, yes, we just, we sort of say to ourselves, yeah, okay, repentance is good. I think I've had enough repentance. Now how about if I just give myself a break? <laughs> I will be okay. There are other people that they haven't even tried all these things that I have done. <laughs> we do these things, we think like this. <laughs> it's funny, but I think this is the reality. And yet we do the same thing. Yeah, of course. And it's quite embarrassing, I have to say, <laughs> if you think about it. And this applies to us as well, as clergy and as monastics. And actually, to be honest, it's even worse because we are always asked to give advice. And then we, when you realize that actually the advice that you give, you're not practicing it. Oh, it's just, it's so painful. Like, it's so painful to see yourself into the mirror without the blindness that we, they have been there for years. Once these blindness, they start coming off. Yes. But there is another thing. When we realize that we are doing things that they are wrong, when we realize that we are weak, when we realize that we are sinful, when we realize that we are not strong enough, when we realize that we are taken aback by our thoughts, when we realize that we are suffering from anger, impatience, and all the rest of the things, there is another thing that we do. We compare ourselves with the others. And there is also something else that we are doing when we realize all these things. For some people, that they are sensitive. You fall into despair, and you say to yourself, you either say to yourself that now there is no salvation for me because how much more I can try about it, or you like to dwell into this state of yours. And although you go to your father confessor and your father confessor says to you, Okay, now you have confessed everything that was very nice of you. Thank you for your trust, your honesty. It takes a lot of courage for you to do this, but can you please forget everything once I read the prayer on you and you make a new start? Because this is what the church says anyway. <laughs> we say in the prayer that the, your sins are forgiven. What is this, that we read prayers and the prayers that don't mean anything? Every single prayer that we read in the church has power. It's not that we read one power and one prayer and we say, oh, this time the prayer worked and another time the prayer did not work. That's why I have to go back to the priest again. There is no way that something like this happens. And then your spiritual father says to him, like, can you please not think, don't think about it anymore. It's just you're okay. God has forgiven you. No. <laughs> Father, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You have no idea what I have done in my life. You just confessed it. <laughs> no. I want to dwell on this. No. <laughs> For a few years, up until something else happens. Why is this bad? Do you have any idea why we all do this? I'm the chief of doing this. <laughs> it's guilt, yes. It's funny, actually, if you think about it, but it's like, if you think about it, you feel like laughing and crying at the same time. Do you know why? Because something like this does not allow you to move forward. And God says to you, I'm giving you the chance to move forward. And you're going backwards. Why do you do this? Like repentance is not looking backwards. 
Repentance means I'm changing my mind, my mindset. I choose a different way. That's why apparently the disciples of Abbas Isaiah once they went and asked him, Yerda, Elda, how would you define repentance? And he said to them, without actual reply to this question, he said to them, listen, there are two ways that you can choose. You either choose the way that leads to life, or you choose a path that leads to perdition. And he gave them no other answer. But this is what repentance is all about. I change my mindset and I follow a new path. So it is good whenever we feel guilt about past sins to move on and not to think that crying for our sins and always feeling sorry and being sad and tearful will make a difference. Once you have confessed something, it is forgiven. Move on. That's why I think on Mount Athos they say that true tears of repentance do not give sadness, but they give you joy happiness and hope. And whenever the fathers on Mount Athos see someone being sad during the day, they say, this father hasn't cried enough during his night. And whenever they see someone who is happy and genuine and joyful, they understand that this father cried a lot during the night in prayer, but these tears gave him joy, hope, hope. Never connect repentance with sadness. Never connect repentance with self-inflicted sadness. Because God never inflicts sadness. I have maybe a few other things to tell you, but I think we have passed our time. So, I don't know if you have any questions to ask me. Yes.
you can understand how kind God is. And yet, it is sad when we realize, and allow me to say this, because even us as clergy, I think we make this mistake sometimes. We present to you an image of God which is not the right one. And uh, we, we, with our words and our directions and our advice sometimes, we present this image of God, a God who is harsh, who is going to throw everyone into hell, who is waiting for you to make any simple, small mistake to condemn you. But then, why do we have confession? Then why God came down to earth for us? Why was He incarnated? Why did He suffer? Why was He crucified? Why was He resurrected? Did to throw all of us to damnation to hell? Did He create all of us just for us to be thrown into eternal judgment. It can't be. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine God like this. It's whatever we have in our heart. If we desire God, because sometimes, and that's why we should never judge. You see people, sometimes appear in modern eh, with tattoos, sometimes with uh, earrings and other rings all around their face, and behaving in a certain way, acting in a certain way, don't, uh, not taking into account whatever you tell them, uh, not being that much approachable, and so many other things. And then you say to yourself, oh, him, okay. Like, she doesn't care about God. You said, she or he doesn't want to have any spiritual life. But you don't know what is this that they desire inside them. And the sad thing is that we judge them and they themselves, they haven't come yet to the realization of what is this that they desire. So instead of just giving them a hand and support to make them realize what is this that they desire, because there isn't a human being who doesn't desire God and salvation, we judge them. And we judge them harshly sometimes. And that is why once I heard something which was amazing from someone who is a very spiritual person. And it made an impression on me. I almost became tearful because I realized how wrong our judgment about God is. In a discussion, this person once told me, you have these people, as I said, that they do not know what they desire. And their actions show that they desire many other things apart from God. And yet, inside them, they have a beautiful heart. They have a kind, genuine heart. More genuine than ours, that we, are, that we think that we are the judges of the earth. And then this spiritual person told us, and when the time comes for these people to meet the Lord, we are all going there sooner or later. 
God will go and say to them, I am the one that you were desiring for your whole life and you didn't know about it. Come next time. When I heard this, I said to myself, you have to change your mindset. That's why the fathers of the church say that when we go up there, we will come across a lot of surprises. The people we think that they were saved might not be. And the people that we thought that they are not saved might be. Repentance is a gift from God and it takes a while up until we realize what are the things that we have to change. And some fathers of the church say that sometimes we have to grow a bit spiritually because it is through these glimpses of grace of God that we receive that we are able to see what is inside us. It's the grace of God that shows to us what is inside us. And sometimes we also have to practice a bit of some virtues. You cannot just sit there and judge anyone and say that you are repenting. Like you have to practice the things that you judge the other people when they don't have them. And that's why I'll just finish with it. Um, Havas Isaias, the same Havas that I told you before, says, How is someone able to understand that the passion of passion, when we love money, is something which is bad? unless we live in poverty for God's sake. How can we understand that the passion of passion is something that it can eat us alive unless we become poor for the person next to us? How is it that we are able to understand the bitterness that is derived by the passion of jealousy. And we should always be careful from the passion of jealousy. It's an underlying passion that sometimes we do not even realize that we have. And it can destroy families, monasteries, relationships, a lot of things, without even realizing that we are suffering from this passion. How is it Abbas Isaiah says that we can realize the bitterness that comes from the passion of jealousy if we do not become meek. Meekness can drive away the passion of jealousy. How is it that, how are you able to understand the agitation that is brought up whenever you are frustrated or angry, if inside you, you do not have forbearance, this doxa di macrothymia suicidia doxasi that we are going to listen 12 times on Great Thursday night, which means glory to you for bearing the Lord, glory to you, is something that has to make us think. Because God was full of forbearance, and yet we are not able to forgive the others. So unless we have forbearance, and we are able to contain everyone inside us, we will never understand that being upset or frustrated with your father, mother, sister, sibling, 
friend is something which is wrong. How can you understand that being proud is something bad for you if you do not experience the fruits that come from humility? How can you understand that judging the others can bring to you a lot of shame unless you realize your own failures? And how can you understand that just sometimes laughing around or laughing at the others is something that you should avoid, especially if you see the people around you being affected. If you do not go through the healing tears that come from the acceptance of your sins. Well, the subject of repentance is a never is a never ending subject. I hope I did not tire you with all the things that I had to say. And um, I ask for forgiveness and we should all all ask tonight for the prayers of each other in order to be able to continue our path to salvation, which is nothing else but the path of repentance. Thank you.